Uh, good morning, everybody. It's like very nice to see you all here. I was just saying to Ken, it's great you all came so early. So we're starting uh, uh, on schedule. Um, and today, as you know, what we're going to be talking about is the changing face of digital innovation uh, in Ireland. Um, this pre and Ken's presentation, Ken Finnegan, we're, I'll introduce them formally in a minute, is will be on the record. And afterwards, the you know, the Q&A, will Chatham House rules apply? I, I think we all know that Ireland is really conscious above its weight when we're looking at innovation. We're ranked 10th in the world for innovation according to the Global Innovation Index. And we're ranked 6th in relation to the European community's digital economy and society. So, you know, we're, we're doing very well and we're particularly lucky today and happy to uh, have Ken um, Finnegan back to talk to us here in the IIE way. He's well placed to discuss and provide insights on how Ireland has managed to achieve what is a, a really good record when you think about it, and is uniquely positioned to take the lead uh, and to look at how we're going to take the lead in digital innovation and digital disruption in the future. Ken is director of the and director of technology and innovation at the Harvard, at the sorry the Harvard the Harvard, oh, Harvard works for me. <laughs> innovation campus, and he has global experience. You probably all know this in research, development, and innovation in high value technology organisations and initiatives that create tangible value. He's also worked very closely with research centres, with universities, and third level institution and helped create a master's degree in AI with three of the universities, which was a, a really big development, I think, and, and really very timely. He was also chief technologist with the IDA and is, was involved in policy development, the creation of jobs and industrial growth. He was responsible in creating national value propositions for Ireland in artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, cyber security and software engineering. So we're particularly lucky, as I say, to have Ken here today, and we look forward to your presentation and your insights. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everybody. I guess it's probably best to start off with, uh, with talking about, I don't know if anybody's seen the news over the past 24 hours, but um, it has been an interesting development with the Harbour Innovation Campus. It's uh, no longer going to be on a ferry terminal in um, Dunleary, which is a shame. Um, but uh, yeah, we're kind of working through that at the moment. It's a, an interesting development, but only a, a minor um, slowdown, let's say, in terms of in terms of the vision that we have um, for Ireland. Um, thank you very much for having me here today, and that was very um, kind introduction. Introduction, especially after the past twenty four hours, is going like, okay, cool. There's, a, there's lots of stuff going on, and we can we can we can make make a change. Um, so the changing face of digital innovation in Ireland. Um, as Joyce mentioned, over the past six, seven years, I've had like a, a great opportunity. Um, I've worked as chief technologist in IDA, and while I was there, um, my day-to-day -day job was understanding Ireland from an innovation perspective, from a tech and innovation perspective, um, getting out there essentially into the field and understanding what large multinationals are doing, but also attracting then multinationals into Ireland. At the same time, there was an opportunity to um, develop uh, value propositions for Ireland. So the past 18 months of artificial intelligence has definitely consumed my life. Um, and I think it's everybody in this room, if you haven't heard about kind of like the, the change or the disruption that artificial is gonna, intelligence is going to have on the world, then you probably haven't been tuned into any media of any sort. Um, so it was, it was an absolute um, joy to work on that. Off the back of developing that pro value proposition, because we'd engaged with an entire, um, with the entire industry around the country and research centre centres, etc., um, we managed to um, secure three and a half million euros from government to set up the first, what we believe to be the first um, collaborative, industry-driven um, national masters in the world. So what that means is the entire masters was actually 
um, defined by industry. So 37 companies came together, and as opposed to university or academia defining what, what should be taught, um, the companies basically specified what should be on that master's. It's getting international recognition. It's been the most successful ICT Skillnet um, master's program or program IC, um, Skillnet Ireland have, have ever run. Um, massively oversubscribed. So that was, a, a, again, a nice demonstration of, of the appetite from, from an AI perspective. Now I jump straight into AI there, but... Uh, so let's, let's kick off. So what is innovation? I have a really simple de definition of innovation. Um, and because I've worked from an enterprise perspective, simply put, innovation is the commercialization of an idea. From a government perspective, it could be the impact of an idea, etc. Creativity is thinking up new things. Innovation is doing new things. This expression here, this formula here, is um, something that I actually have written on my desk and framed on my desk because I think it's a really nice demonstration of, of innovation slash creativity. So C is for creativity equals the function of A, and I'll explain what A is in a second. But K-I-E, K is knowledge, I is imagination, and E is evaluation. A is attitude. If you've got the wrong attitude, you're gonna, you don't have innovation, you don't have creativity. And it's a, it's a conversation that, that I've been having especially um, a lot recently from an enterprise perspective, but also from um, an innovation perspective. If there's people on your team, if you want to innovate and there's individuals on your team or there's a general kind of like culture of no, you're not, you're going nowhere fast. Um, I think, there's a way to change that as well. If you have people on your teams that kind of like go like, no, get them to say, but what if? But what if opens up the conversation? Um, so I guess innovation, commercialization of idea. To commercialize an idea, you have to be able to have those ideas. No, no stemmies that, um, that opportunity. So why has the term digital innovation become so ubiquitous? Everybody's talking about it these days. Um, as I mentioned, artificial intelligence is, is um, topic du jour currently. Um, but essentially, the term innovate or die was, was coined in the late uh, 90s um, in Forbes by um, a gentleman's name who I can't remember right now. And it started, I guess it started um, in 1998, especially with the digital, the first era, the web 0.1, when the digital innovation happened. And companies and individuals started to recognize as like, okay, um, we have a store or we have some type of enterprise. We need to get online. We need to just be um, digi uh, digitally aware, sell our products and services online. That um, mentality has become so ubiquitous and it's underpinned by digitization. And we, I'll explain that in a second. As I mentioned, we have artificial intelligence. Everybody's talking about it. And they're not individual. Um, all these technologies don't, aren't, they don't stand by themselves anymore. They, everything is starting to work together. And this is where the complication is, is, is uh, how it's becoming, why it's becoming really complicated, challenging, and there's a lot of opportunities. So if you think about like from an IoT perspective, is everybody familiar with the Internet of Things? So the, the idea is putting a sensor on whatever you want. I could have one on my coat to measure kind of like my location or measure my biometric information. Um, that information can be collected. And if you're collecting um, millions, billions of in, um, people's information, AI is the solution that will look at that information and, and, and do some type of predictive analytics or say, like, okay, maybe you need to buy a new coat. This one's too old. Or basically, provide some insight. 5G is about to come on the market. Um, next summer, we'll, we'll see the arrival of 5G. What this means is currently uh, pipes that we communicate through um, have a certain capacity. By when 5G is, a, is launched, it's going to change the way communication happens. So instead of downloading a movie, um, which you probably could have done a few years ago, but in, in hours, 5G will allow it to happen in seconds. So communication and the, tr the transfer of data will happen in a much quicker way. Augmented virtual reality, um, really fascinating things happening from that perspective as well. We've seen um, clothes stores where you can walk into now and using my, my jacket again, it's like you can actually um, look at the screen and it'll put on the jacket for you and you can, it'll measure you up and give, give you the right um, size and, and colors, etc. 
in and around but that's just one application area. If you look at autonomous vehicles, um, the, the um, application of Google Maps onto the windscreen of cars, um, there's lots of, lots, lots of opportunities happening there. Um, quantum computing is the next big thing. I don't know much about that myself at the moment, but if you have a conversation or if you look at IBM, they've just developed the first quantum computing. Again, the speed and size of computers, or the speed is getting exceptionally fast, size is small. Robotics and artificial again, artificial intelligence goes hand in hand. Um, Ireland is really strong in AI. We don't have such a heritage in robotics, and we can see kind of like there's some um, there's some good um, work coming out of Trinity at the moment. I don't know if anybody's been to Asia, and some of the Asian hotels have um, have um, Pepper the computer or the little robot that has a little screen that welcomes you. You've seen them, yeah. Um, Ireland developed Stevie, so Stevie. So Trinity, is, um, Professor, Professor Conor McGinn has developed a little robot called Stevie. Now Stevie isn't just for kind of like welcoming you into the foyer of a hotel. They're very much focused on um, assisting elderly and infirm people in, 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 in the likes of um, old folks home and in, in convalescent homes. They want them to have a specific function in those areas. Um, and there's really interesting work actually happening with um, his company that he spun out from Trinity. Black. Alone, yeah, well, Dave. That for, for elderly people. Yeah, and Alone actually won a yeah. prize a couple of years ago from the Social Innovation Fund, I think they got, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alone and Network Casala. Yeah. Really interesting, actually a fantastic example of the application of um, technology in, in an environment um, where you can look after elderly people. So in, in Dundalk, there's a, there's a living lab. So there's 16 apartments, and those apartments are, have approximately 200,000 sensors in them, whether they're on the floor, under mats, whether they're on the doors, etc. cetera. Um, and the whole idea is to monitor um, and give independence to elderly people that are afraid to live alone. So they're able to, like, for example, when they get out of bed at nighttime, when they step on their mat, the light comes on automatically. Um, one of the studies actually I saw from alone was um, it was using, again, IoT and, I won't say AI, but definitely IoT, where every time they walked in and out of their house or every time they got up and out, uh, into bed and out of bed, um, everything was recorded. When certain individuals went to their doctor, the doctor was able to see their movement patterns. It, to identify depression is, is very subjective. You go to the doctor and the doctor will ask you, how do you feel? And if you're kind of like, if you're an open person, you might go, look, I feel pretty depressed right now. But some people are embarrassed about mental health issues. Um, so they'll say, you know what, I'm, I'm not too bad. So it's really hard to identify if they're actually suffering from mental health issues. With the information that they were able to collect about the movement of individuals, they're able to, the doctor can look at the data and subjectively go, like, I see a change in your behavior. For example, a depressed person um, doesn't like to, w won't leave their house typically to go shopping during the day because there's more people they can potentially move, bump into. They leave later on at night. And you can see these changes in this data. You can, over time, so in a year's time or over six months, you can recognize this change of information. Now, it could be just a change in behavior, but at least the doctor is um, equipped with information to go like, okay, there is a change in your, in your behaviors. Are you sure you're okay? And it gives the doctor more opportunity to kind of like investigate and, um, understand, and that's I guess a really nice example of the power of 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 technology and what it can do. Um, so yeah, first of all, there's a the tech, like it's overwhelming: artificial intelligence, blockchain, five G, robotics, cybersecurity. There's so much going on out there. Uh, I was at a cybersecurity conference recently, and it was specifically about cybersecurity, but they talked about artificial intelligence and they talked about blockchain. Mm -hmm. So we, they're not silos anymore. They're starting to come together. And trying to get your head around this is 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 very challenging. Second, there's that, night, that example um, that Joyce mentioned. There's the application area of those technologies. So up there we have um, autonomous vehicles. So uh, Violetta Bulk, the commissioner for um, transportation in the European Commission, wants to see European streets and roads um, totally autonomized by 2040. So it's every car in, in Europe, every vehicle um, autonomous by 2040. The, the main driver behind this, there's a quarter of a million people die on the streets of Europe every year. Um, so to, to bring, the, the, target is have, the target is to have zero deaths on European roads. 
Um, human error causes obviously most um, accidents. I know there's some kind of like uh, some horror stories already with regards to people being in accidents with um, autonomous vehicles, but we're at the very start of that journey. When the machines are all communicating with each other, apparently it's going to be a uh, it's going to be interesting. But turning turning a car into a technical device, a technology device, is that idea of convergence. It's like the application of microelectronics, communication technology, um, data analytics, um, and merging them all together to work seamlessly with each other. Um, we've spoken about, from a health perspective, there's so many opportunities. I, it's, I was glad to see um, the new CEO of the um, um, HSE is can anybody help me out with his name here? He's ex um, Intel. Martin Curley. Martin Curley, thank you. Yeah. I drew a blank there. I was delighted to see Martin Curley yeah. has taken over that role. He's like voted um, top CIO um, in Europe um, back in 2015, and I think hopefully he will have a massive impact in, in terms of what they can do, um, because the opportunity from a health perspective is phenomenal. Um, another interesting, and this is really relevant from an Irish perspective, um, advanced manufacturing. We're not a we are a manufacturing economy. 33% of our GDP de depends on, on, on manufacturing. Um, we're not low cost, so it's not like the good old days of, of having low skilled workers on low wages. We are an advanced economy. We need to, we need to reduce costs. So, so if you go into some of the factories around the, the country, they're absolutely spectacular in terms of the robotics and the technology that they have. Um, I've been invited to give a talk to, uh, and this is actually really interesting. Over the past year, I was invited to speak to radiologists about artificial intelligence. So you can see different sectors and industry starting to prepare. They recognize, okay, there's a potential disruption to our industry. How do we prepare? Um, so with the accountants, the Accountancy Association of Ireland, they've invited me to come and have a talk with them about artificial intelligence because any job that can be, um, that has routine in it, essentially a, a, a robot essentially, an AI can do robotic process automation is the disruptor there. Um, so we're seeing everybody from radiologists to accountants to, to, to all these different individuals starting to prepare for what's next. And it's a really kind of, it's a mentality that I, that I very much encourage and I'm always happy to have um, discussions with people because, because the future of our work is, is transforming. The whole idea of uh, the education system at the moment, it was in like uh, going to primary school, secondary school, college, coming out and then doing a job. That's no longer the future. We need to prepare ourselves as well as, um, as, well as enterprise. Um, yeah, and then I have a picture of government there. Um, we have issues, I know, in government, but I can see them t starting to t take, um, take action. I was, I've been on, I've sat on steering committees or committees in looking at and, and, and addressing kind of like why is Ireland in number 10 in the world for innovation, but at times our government can, doesn't necessarily embrace it. So there's a lot of kind of like a lot of work being there to try and address that. Number one, I always say is we always come down to culture, I guess. The second point, and an interesting point from my days in IDA, when a multinational comes to Ireland, they get to see the crown jewels, they get to see why Ireland for innovation, they get to see the amazing things that are going on around the country. Um, as part of the plan uh, with the Harbour Innovation Campus, that it was to make somewhere that a nice demonstrator where everybody could come to, to go and demonstrate what was going on there. We'll still get it, we'll still get to that. Finally, I just want to talk about business models as well, because everything's changing. Your traditional way of doing business is, is no longer, um, it's, it's, yeah, that says it all, basically. Um, I'm sure you've seen, many people in the room have seen this um, slide before, but it's just, it reinforces the, that, that idea of business models. Uber, the largest taxi company, um, it owns no cars. Airbnb owns no real estate. Mm. Skype doesn't have any telecom telecommunications infrastructure. Now you're adding Alibaba. Has anybody ever shopped from Alibaba or Wish? Yeah, me too. Um, and only recently, and I'm kind of going like, I, I, you can see the benefit, you know. Um, Facebook, Society One, Netflix, Apple, Go or Apple and Google for, for, for um, software, no apps, just platforms. The whole idea of the platform economy is becoming ubiquitous. I look at this and I don't know if I feel terrified or if I feel kind of like there's, there's, there's more opportunity here. 
We saw last week um, the Irish government are starting to prepare um, legislation for controlling Airbnb um, um, in, in Ireland, and that's happening all around the world at the moment. So we are definitely on a journey, and some organisations are well ahead in, in terms of that journey, um, especially the digital native organisations. I think what the, the massive opportunity that we see at the moment is non-digital organisations and that idea of convergence. So the health sector, the, the um, transportation industry, um, the ones I talked about a few moments ago. Um, every company is a technology company. No matter what product or service it, prov it provides, the companies that embrace this fact are the ones to shape our world. So this is a, a Gartner um, partner, Peter Sondergaard. It, it, that's his quote. Also, it's Pascal Donoghue, Minister for, uh, Minister for Finance, Irish go um, Government. He, he's, I've seen him speak over the past two weeks, paraphrasing this. He's aware that every company needs to become a digital, uh, needs to become a digital organization, irrespective of your sector. And I think it's so important. I think the European Commission have, um, have identified this as well. And if you, if you look up the European Commission, you'll see digital innovation hubs. So the idea is that no organization across Europe is more than a 45 minute drive from a digital um, innovation hub. And we had a conversation that we want to have two in every region, and at least a minimum of two in every region in Ireland. Um, and the idea is, okay, I'm an accountancy firm, or I'm a, an agricultural association of some sort. What's going on? Like, like I hear this AI is going to, like, we'll have autonomous tractors and drones flying in the air measuring grass growth, and you'll have fertilizer being spread by, um, by machines. Like, how do we start this journey? Where do we go? And that's the, that's the biggest challenge for organizations at the moment. It's like, I know my business, but I don't know technology. Where do I go to have this first conversation? Um, so the idea of digital innovation hubs is great from a, from, um, from a European perspective that, that companies will have somewhere to go. Okay, so the third challenge um, for organizations is the speed of innovation. So typically in innovation, you have what they call the S-curve of innovation. So at the bottom of the S, you have early adopters. So, and we've all seen this, when the first iPhone, or when an iPhone, is, a new iPhone is released, you have those crazy people that sit outside the shops going like, yes, it's a new color. <laughs> I want to get the white one. And people do, they queue up for, for the early adopters, yeah, are the guys that want, want the, the, the first of the new tech. Then you've got me, I guess, the, the growth spurt, where it's like, okay, well, the, the iPhone is out like two or three months, pretty safe, it's working, there's no complaints. Um, and as, as sales happen, essentially, over time, then you approach what they call the innovation window. And, it's, and this, is, this is where you see kind of like it happening again with phones. It's like um, the apples of the world will, will start teasing us with new features. And it's like, it's like on the next iPhone, there's going to be this feature, this feature, this feature. So that's fine. Then you jump from the top of the S-curve onto your next innovation um, into your next innovation window and you've got a new phone or you've got a new product or you've got a new service, etc. Now the problem with this, or not the problem, the, the biggest challenge with this is traditionally on the left hand side there you can see um, yeah, uh, an innovation phase would have taken years normally. With the advent of digital um, innovation and and digitization, these are getting so close together that it's hard to make sense and it's hard to stay on top of all the different technologies and all the opportunities. And, it, and, and innovate or die is like, if you, don't, if you don't recognize this, it can be lethal for your organization. So this is, again, why, why um, the speed of things, it's just baffling to stay on top of it. So and finally, fourth, the evolution. So innovation itself is being innovated. Right, um, just to make things complicated. So originally, you have closed innovation. Closed innovation is like, okay, I'm an Intel, I'm an IBM, I'm whoever. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hire really smart people and I'm going to put them in the basement for four months and they're going to come up with new products and services for me. And they don't look outside their organization. Um, this, the advent in the past four or five years, we've seen the advent of open innovation, and, and there's loads of programs and tools to help encourage um, open innovation. The idea is all about collaboration. Um, has anybody ever heard of the whole design thinking methodology where essentially you put your customer at the center of your solution and you don't let engineers, you don't let salespeople, you don't let anybody tell you what to design, you tell, let the customer go, this is what I want. And it can be really easily achieved. I heard a really fantastic example from Fidelity Investments. Um, 
I came up with this new idea for a like pension, a 401k, whatever they're called in the States. And they, um, like as opposed to building a prototype or as opposed to letting any software engineer or uh, uh, get an expensive work done, they went and got a big piece of cardboard, cut out a little kind of like ice cream van shaped mm -hmm. van, stood on the main street in Boston and got pe and asked people as they were walking up and down the street, if you had a pension that gave you this, if you had a pension that looked like this. So they got input from potential customers before they even started developing. And I think the whole idea is that they were able to collect information in and around what products and services that they can sell from essentially the horse's mouth. And that was the actual approach we took with the AI masters as well. Um, we, the objective, for, at least from, from an IDA perspective, was to understand why Ireland for artificial intelligence. And traditionally, we would have gone to the big four, our consultants, to tell us what was, what, what, why Ireland, essentially, and the opportunity. This time, we decided to take a different approach. We decided to use the design thinking approach. And we brought in um, 60 individuals from SMEs, from multinationals. We brought in government officials. We had academic um, research institutions. And we had um, uh, the unions in there as well. And we brought the unions in because there's going to be a massive social impact because of AI. So we brought everybody together and we asked them numerous questions like what are you what are you doing what do you see as the value from an AI perspective etc cetera, etc cetera. and from that day we were able to kind of like get a really good decent really good insight into why what's great about Ireland for artificial intelligence intelligence but at the same time we asked them what do you need from us what do you need from government to help to help progress that story um, and we're still kind of like doing doing work in it at the moment as well but the whole idea is that it's collaboration and that's the that is the future of innovation now and the final one here, innovation network ecosystem, is a really interesting. Um, it feeds into the whole idea of, of of open innovation. In order to bring the right people into a room to have a discussion about artificial intelligence, you need to have an ecosystem. You need to understand who those players are, and I'll talk about that actually in a second. So I hope you feel like um, I've I've overwhelmed you with information. But just to <laughs> summarise. Um, so we've defined what an innovation is. It's the commercialization, essentially, of an idea. Um, why our organizations need to innovate, essentially innovate or die. It's, it's, it's nobody will, will tolerate, um, your customers won't tolerate kind of like old-fashioned technology, old-fashioned um, solutions. There's massive challenges to do this. It's like we're at, we're at a really exciting time. I think it's like it's from a, from a, from a, and not even from an innovation, but from an enterprise perspective, the companies that will survive are the ones that have the little A. They figured out the attitude. They figured out that it's like, okay, okay like, mm -hmm. not going to say no, but what if we did it this way? What if we did it that way? No is a wall. I remember years ago, a friend of mine who was studying um, or who was working in the um, advertising agency, they work in teams of a copywriter and a, I can't remember the second person, but it's always two people within the team. And the one rule was never say no, because when you're working in a team of two, no is a, is a wall that blocks mm -hmm. any ideas. Mm -hmm. And that idea of, of collaboration and creativity, if you want to innovate, is essential. And then finally, we discussed the evolution of innovation itself. All right, so that's kind of like from an innovation perspective. So why Ireland? Now, I'm going to do kind of like a little bit of an IDA pitch here. Um, I'm happy that none of my ex-IDA colleagues um, came here this morning, because I've probably hashed it up. But we are tent in the world for innovation, um, according to the Global Innovation Index. I had the pleasure of sitting on stage with the Australian, um, the head of innovation for the Australian, Australian and New Zealand government a few weeks ago. They were 22 and 22, or 20 and 22. So it was a nice position to be in to kind of like have the discussion why. Um, and there's an opportunity to leverage, leverage all of this. As I say, sometimes when we're based here in our offices, we don't see the amazing things that go on, and I think there's an opportunity to kind of like, okay, there are great, there's great things happening around the country. I think we need to become better at talking about that. We are globally a globally recognised um, uh, technology cluster, um, and uh, within other sectors as well, so pharma, financial service, agriculture, medtech. Um, I've been invited to Prague, to Croatia in a few weeks, to talk to their government about innovation and. The context or the brief that I've been given, if I was to look at Ruth Noller's equation, the A doesn't exist from a Croatian government's um, 
um, perspective. I've been told that they are anti-technology because they know it's going to disrupt jobs, and I'm kind of like, that's essentially this is like um, essentially like not a good um, news story for for, for Croatia. Um, the capabilities that exist in Ireland, again, looking at from an IDA perspective, is the four T's. So t there's talent. We've got an exceptionally talented um, workforce. Um, technology, um, in a uh, competitive tax rate, 12.5%. Um, and, yeah, well, I put this in there, scale up and scale out, and I was in my conclusions as well. One thing that we don't really talk about and that we, that I think Ireland has a really fantastic ability in, and the multi multinationals have seen this, is the ability, it's like, we have 1,384 multinationals in Ireland th and that are clients of IDAs. They can't be a client of IDA if they're only serving the Irish market, so they have to be able to scale up and scale out of the country and sell products and services into, um, into Europe or beyond, DMEA. Well, I, 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 I try and understand why our SME sector haven't leveraged that, that capability to the, to, the extent that, um, to the extent that we should have as well. It's there, and I think actually if we can put policy around it, or if we can put a program in place of some sort to leverage that ability to scale up and scale out, actually Ireland could have the next, our own homegrown Intel or something like that. Again, and then finally, agility. We're a small country, four and a half million people. Um, it's easy to, if I need to get in touch with somebody working in Intel, if I need to get in touch with somebody working in government, it usually only takes one or two phone calls. Mm -hmm. um, so having, uh, having an idea of what you need and what you want, um, it's not that hard to get it done in Ireland. You just have to kind of like ask the questions and know the people to ask, I guess. Um, this is really um, a nice indicator of again, why we're number 10th in the world, why there's a massive opportunity there. Um, in my five, four years in IDA, when I joined in 2014, there was a target of having 3 billion euros invested into multinationals by 2019, over five years. That target was reached within three years. So from a macroeconomic perspective as well, there's something really happening. There's a lot of, I guess there's a lot of confidence in what companies are doing from a multinational perspective. Um, simply by looking at the numbers that have been invested. And again, they've leveraged the talent and capability that exists in Ireland. Again, how do we, how do we leverage that? And finally, um, this is just a fun fact um, I put in in some presentations. I had to give a presentation to the European Commission earlier on this year about artificial intelligence and, and Ireland. And as of last year, more people work directly in tech than in agriculture. So we've turned that corner from being an agrarian society into a technically advanced society. And I think it's, um, it's, it's just an, a, a nice milestone, a nice indicator of kind of like where we've come from to where we're going. Um, I had a picture of a potato turned into microchips. I don't think they, they got it when I... <laughs> Mavidius, I actually had a Mavidius chip there, which, is, which was acquired by um, Intel. And this, again, this is um, collateral from IDA, but I, I, when discussing technology in Ireland and the journey that we've gone on as a state, this, was, this is powerful. So you can see in 1956, 62 years ago, um, IBM, IBM came to Ireland, one of the first multinationals that came to Ireland. Um, they set up and they had low-skilled manufacturing jobs. So essentially, the, the assembly of machines and the, um, the packing of boxes and shipping and stuff, right? And I always use IBM as that um, really great example of a company that's evolved over the 60 years in Ireland to, from low-skilled manufacturing to we have 3,000 software engineers, or they have 3,000 software engineers, their largest number of software engineers working outside of the States, working in Ireland. Um, and working on projects such as their Watson platform, their artificial intelligence platform. One of their only um, labs outside of the US is based here in Dublin as well. So this, that evolution that has happened in IBM, look at the following companies as well, mm -hmm. all tech, 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 tech. It's very similar journeys have happened with those organizations as well. What I really like about this slide as well, if we go, I stay here in front of the microphone, if we go, go to kind of like when the crash happened in 2008, we see kind of like up until that stage, and I did, this is very much tech focused, 
But we have a lot of tech companies coming into the country. We have a lot of tech uh, mm -hmm. organizations recognizing, okay, um, initially coming here for low-skill manufacturing. And then there was a glut towards the end of the 90s and beginning of the noughties where we had, as somebody said, the industrialization, industrialization of call centers. Uh, they'd never seen anything happen like it before in the world, and we had the industrialization of call centers. As you move on towards the crash, um, and I'm not attributing this to the crash, but a lot more companies started moving into Ireland to, lever to leverage the technology capability, not just in tech. So you have the likes of Zalando there. It's an e-commerce platform that sells fashion, for example, from, from Germany. Their story is amazing. They, looked at four, they were looking at four different locations around Europe for their digital um, our data anal um, analytics teams. So they're going to open up four different hubs. They decided to set up the whole thing in Dublin, um, which was a big coup, I guess. Daiquiri, an augmented reality company, um, MetLife, first data, Becton Dickinson, Becton Dickinson, the pharmaceutical company, again, they're, so they're focused on setting up their technology um, um, development campus down in Limerick as well. So what you see is that idea of convergence. The multinational sector are recognizing this, like we can get the skills here in Ireland for the technical skills um, in, order to, in order to provide platforms to the world, essentially. As I say, it's a really kind of like powerful um, um, infographic just to show the journey that the country has come on from a, at least from a multinational perspective, but also leveraging how they've leveraged um, capability in Ireland. So there are challenges. Um, there's a lot of opportunity, but there are challenges. Um, the Quarterly Economic Observer um, released last week, I think it was. So in policy terms, the success of, of foreign direct investment should be measured by the spillover effects rather than simply scale. So there is a challenge there in terms of has the economy, have our SMEs felt the impact of the capability that's grown through the multinational sector? And it's, I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting um, uh, topic that needs to be addressed and identified. Looking at it from an innovation perspective, there is so much opportunity there. We looked at, looked at the whole idea of um, externally focused or open innovation where uh, and we've seen the release of the DTIF the disruptive technology innovation fund have you heard of th this fund um, it's half a billion fund over the next five years for disruptive technologies it was the first year was this year was 20 million it was low this year because I think the department wants to um, understands the potential for this but it was massively subscribed to so over 300 organizations applied put in applications for this and um, we put in two ourselves um, and the whole idea, if you read the application, it's collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. The whole, it has to be driven by an Irish company, an SME. You can bring a multinational and a research centre on that journey with you, but the whole idea is, is, is collaboration. So that's a really, really e um, excellent tool and a great initiative from the government. Um, the second part, innovation networks and ecosystems. This is something that we can leverage in Ireland really s simply. As, is, as Joyce mentioned, I developed value propositions for software engineering, cybersecurity, internet of things, and artificial intelligence. And the idea of developing these propositions is like understanding what the ecosystem looks like. It's not hard to identify an ecosystem. Again, if we put some structures around this place, marry these two, open innovation, and, our, our, and understand our ecosystems, we could be in it. We could, potentially be in a really powerful position along with um, tools such as DTIF. Now, this is, um, <laughs> I guess, tying back to the vision that we had in the Harbour Innovation Campus. So it's, it's, it's my work that we'll figure out how, it's, uh, how it works in the future. But I guess the message is everything that I've just discussed and, and, and alluded to. Every organization that wants to go on, that wants to innovate, has to go on a specific journey. And there's only, like having dealt with hundreds of multinationals moving to Ireland, there's, there's a num uh, numerous tools, or there's a finite amount of tools that each company needs um, in order to kind of like expedite innovation. First of all, funding. The whole idea is like, if you're an Irish company, if you're a startup, if you're an SME, if you're a spin out, if you're a spin in, where are you going to get the money? Um, there's funding there available from IDA, Enterprise Ireland, Science Foundation, and all the other, um, um, a lot of the other um, government agencies. Skills, you need people to do the job. Um, talent, again, from universities and college. I have my fourth point there is collaboration, and it is talking about that idea of open, open collaboration, co-creation, co-innovation. I have the Disruptive Technology Innovation Fund there. It's, it is, it's no longer, it's like if you want, if you're an agricultural company and you want to understand that AI, if you want to understand IoT, 
et cetera, et cetera. You need to collaborate. Nobody can own this anymore. Professional services and then prototyping services. Again, prototyping services was really or is important. If you're an organization, you don't want to have to hire expensive technologists. You want to be able to build a prototype and go like, does it work, doesn't it work, um, without having the cost of hiring those people. Um, there are some services around the country, and I'm happy to talk about them if, um, if anybody wants. Now, once you get to your prototype, this is where Ireland is, uh, it becomes really interesting. Once you get to your prototype, if you're multinational, you have global um, established organizations, global tech, um, global connectivity, you have your global networks, you have your scale, you have your capabilities to commercialize, you have your networks and supply chain. So it's actually the journey from building a prototype to scaling it up and selling it off around the world is not that difficult for multinationals. It's, it's, they have that bridge over the valley of debt, but that's the start for Irish SMEs. When you have your product or service, it's like, okay, then the hard work begins, then you fall off essentially the cliff. I guess what, what I would love to see, and I think we're re I believe we we're reaching a place where, where we can have this conversation, is how do we leverage that 1,384 multi multinationals in Ireland, not just for funds, but let's say how do we leverage their capabilities? That's what Station F, and I've mentioned Station F um, a few times this morning, but Station F is the largest innovation campus in the world, and what they, it's in Paris. It was set up by Xavier Nell, the guy that just bought um, Aircom, actually, or Air. And the idea is to bring that triple helix of innovation together, bring government departments, bring um, academic institutes, and bring enterprise together so that they can help leverage um, their, their SME, or SME um, companies and the capabilities that exist there. This can be done in multiple different ways. Uh, I've been working on this, and we'll see where, where as I say, we, we, we'll go with this. But um, an opportunity there. And the reason why I think there's an opportunity right now is because we're reaching full employment. When we reach full employment, what does that mean for the country? Do we, we, we need to come up with some new creative ideas in terms of not just attracting talent, talent into the country, but it's like, how do we ensure that like, we don't have an overdependence on the multinational um, um, ecosystem in Ireland, that we can grow our own companies? So just to finish up, so we need, I think we're doing a pretty good job. I think we can do better to la leverage our, our tent in the world for innovation position, our techno technological um, position. As I say, going over to Croatia in a few weeks, and the reason I'm going over is because they're afraid that, they don't, that if they don't change their attitude that they will be left behind. Um, I think we, we have the right attitude in Ireland. I think we can do more. Um, focus on collaboration. DTF is a good start. I'd like to see the, 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 the whole idea of a process for innovation, not overly over, over, overbearing, but a process for innovation looked at as well. So we're good at kind of like, it's like, here you go, here's some money for, for creating your um, products and services, but it would be good to kind of like actually give them training wheels or give them kind of like some guidance as well. Um, and that's my point, the process of innovation, commercialization and the tools, again, uh, leveraging the ecosystem here. Scaling companies, as I mentioned, it's, it's something that we do really, really well. Why aren't we able to scale Irish companies um, as, as well as, as the multinationals are able to leverage that? Um, and then finally creating the environments to happen. Um, that was, that was the, the plan for um, uh, no ferry terminal in Dunleary. So if anybody <laughs> wants to invest in a, in a, a really spectacular piece of uh, infrastructure that has, a, that has planning in place, <laughs> um, there's an opportunity there. Thank you very much. Thanks. That's good. Thank you.